Well, Smiley, the final event of the 2020, I guess it's still the 2022-2023 PGA Tour season is officially in the books. I'm glad that next season we can just, just one calendar year. Uh, Victor Hovland is your Tour Championship winner, your FedEx Cup champion, runs away with it to the tune of 18 mil, uh, goes back to back in the final two playoff events. What a strange August on the PGA Tour where you had just two winners total in the month, Lucas Glover, of course, winning the Wyndham and the FedEx St. Jude, Vic winning the BMW Championship and the Tour Championship. Uh, I just want to pause here for a moment to give you your flowers. I mean, you have been on the Victor train all season long. I, I, I think I'm recalling this correctly. You were on a Golf Digest pod months ago where you put him in the same co- category as John Rahm, Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy at the time. I think that was seized upon as some sensational headline. Can you believe Smiley said this? And here we are end of the season guy has three wins on tour, wins the FedEx cup and is looking like every bit as good as, as any of those guys, one of, one of the top three, top five players in the world. So, I mean, just reflecting on that season of, of just sort of Victor's rise, you know, what, what, what was it like watching that? And, and, you know, what do you think the future holds for Vic? Man, uh, Victor Hovland just finishing the year on a tear, obviously winning the tour championship, winning the BMW championship. And I was in Atlanta on, I believe it was Wednesday this week and was at the hotel, uh, where all the players were staying at and up drives Victor Hovland in the valet hops out of the car. And I kind of just wanted to joke around and say, let me get that car for you, sir. You know, he just, he just won BMW <laughs> championship, but I had a chance to catch out with him for a minute. And, uh, was, and first thing I said to him, was like, Vic 28 on the back nine. That's all you had. He's like, yeah, that's all I had. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, uh, you could tell that, uh, he still was in that. You could see it in his eyes that he still had work work to be done this week and, mm. uh, going out there. And I really just felt like, Scotty Scheffler starting with a two shot lead. I just thought that would be enough for him because because it seemed like if you would have given a two shot lead the entire year for every single event he played, he would have won like eight times or nine times <laughs> just uh, because that's what it seemingly came down to uh, time after time with Scotty Scheffler just being right there, but not quite getting the job done. But um, man, I, I, to back to Victor, I will say that really when I started noticing that this guy this year is just going to be a problem. Uh, It was at Bay Hill and it from, from Bay Hill to the players championship, this guy just, he's always been, in my opinion, probably my favorite golf swing on the tour and, Mm. and my favorite ball striker on the tour. Nobody swings the golf club with more freedom than this guy, because I think technically he is some of the best hits, some of the best positions of any player on tour. He's got so much control, but the big question marks with Victor was about his short game. And he was confused. Didn't really feel like he had the right technique because his golf swing, he has a shut uh, club face in his golf swing. Mm -hmm. And typically most really good pitchers are more weak handed open face uh, with, with, with pitching. And Victor did not really have that in his in his game. He tried to do that, but really just with no success. And you could you could hear it in his voice and in videos and interviews, just how much he's struggled with chipping and that he just needs to continue to work on it. In comes Joe Mayo. And I just watched these two guys practice week in and week out. And I think one of the things that Joe Mayo said, uh, to me at one point was just that, you know, Joe doesn't want to be out there, but Joe has been there every single step of the way. Hmm. And he doesn't want to be out there. The fact that like, I don't want to be there because I want Victor to know exactly what he's doing that in the field is like, he doesn't need me. And I think when I watch them work, the things I noticed was just, there wasn't any stone unturned as far as the amount of shots they were trying Mm -hmm. to add to his arsenal. It wasn't just, I think it started with like, Hey, this is the technique that you're going to have, which one of the main things they worked on was trying to get his low point moving towards his front foot in the backswing. That and, he, he says something about that. They interviewed him on the broadcast. And I'm actually curious to hear you break down the technical piece of this, where he, where he talked about maybe like almost getting steeper and moving the low point up. Can you explain yeah. that to the layman? 
<laughs> well, it's the most important thing in pitching. Um, <laughs> and just picture just like a, a flashlight coming out of your sternum. And okay. how I picture pitching is I need to have my chest pointing out in front of the golf ball. And most of the time, like you definitely needed an impact, but I'll start my chest out in front of the golf ball just to preset it there to where my, ch- my chest is now here and I can just rotate and I know my low point is going to be out in front of the ball. Why people struggle in pitching is that they set up like their full swing and they think like, you know what, I can hit my seven iron really well and I'd, I'd make good contact. But with the same setup, you know, pitching your low point is now, you know, six inches behind the golf ball. So you have to find a way to get, <laughs> you're sitting there making a motion like, how- <laughs> well, I, I, well I'm, try, I'm trying to figure it out because this, all this stuff's fascinating to me. And I'm sure there are other people listening who are, you know, have similar struggles with their short game and, and pitching and who are interested in this sort of thing. So are you, is, does the ball position, if you're, if you're, if you're moving the low point in front of the ball, where does the ball position in relation to center of stance, you know, standard full swing setup? Well, you know, it, if you if you ask Phil Mickelson, it changes a bunch. But I've okay. I've never really understood the way Phil uh, kind of uses the <laughs> uses the bounce, and he he's one of the best of all time. I just I I just did it what I felt like was a, a very efficient way. I would put it on my left heel every time. The only left time I would start really that far yeah, forward, it would be Interesting. forward, and then I would get my chest forward. Um, yeah, so. One of the deals is, you know, maybe in the rough, I'll get the get the ball position a little further back. Uh, that that'll help keep the ball in the face a little longer. But kind of back to Victor uh, on what he was able to figure out, and him and Joe Mayo was find the technique to work. So mm-hmm. so they they figured out on the way back, I'm going to move my chest in front of the golf ball. So like we're taking a backswing, mm-hmm. but our weight is shifting almost towards our front foot to get our chest on the left on our left foot. So that helps him there know, all right, I can just deliver the bounce correctly. I don't have to back up out of it because I'm already over there. That is interesting. And it's not, I guess you could say it's kind of, it's the stack, but he doesn't, right, till. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. from there he just, like, he just goes, but stack, the stack and no till. <laughs> yeah. You can see it. He yeah. exaggerates it pretty hard on pretty much everything with his pitching, but you know, it's, it's taken his game to the next level and I just watched them for 30 minutes in a bunker in Austin this year for the match play. And they would put a ball in the front of the bunker. They would put on the side hill, uphill, back, back slope. And after every shot, you know, either Victor would ask a question or Joe Mayo would give um, feedback or an answer. And I think it's it's so important to understand the why of mm-hmm. like, why, like, why do I need to do this? And and I think Victor didn't know how to do it. So he definitely has the skill. It just He just needed the, all the correct information. And I'm really, I definitely want to look at his stats from maybe right around Bay Hill all the way until now. And I was listening to the broadcast and Trevor Immelman was saying that he was leading um, the tour championship in, in scrambling this week. And I know there's 30 guys, but still, yeah, it's you know, impressive. that's just... You know, it, it, there's just not a weakness in his game. And, you know, with Victor, that's what I saw at the um, he didn't win at Bay Hill. He was very close to winning. He was very close to winning at the players. And just as the year went on, you know, he shoots 65 the first round of the Masters. And you're thinking in your head like, shoot, he's going to go win this thing. And um, he, he obviously didn't didn't win a major this year. But I just have a hard time believing that he's just not going to uh, be a guy that wins, you know, four plus majors. So, so tell me this then from a tour pro sort of perspective, it, it, this could be just a crazy line of thought, but if you're looking at that, the way that season is played out, right. And you're really kind of clicking, hitting form at the end of the season, all the stuff that you've been working on short game is falling into place. You're, you're putting well as part of you kind of bum the season's ending as long as it is. And, and, and as arduous as it can be, you know, do you think there's any part of him that just wants to keep playing competitive golf because he's finding his form and everything's clicking. And now it's like, this makes sense. I just want to keep going because I'll probably keep winning everything I play in. Um, not, not, I mean, there's only four majors on the year. So I think all he really cares about is getting ready for the masters. I don't think it really matters to him because Anybody that played Memphis two weeks ago and played in Atlanta this (laughs) week probably doesn't want to do anything with a golf club come next week. So the the answer to my question is Lucas Glover's hands. (laughs) Yeah, it's based on the weather is is no, he probably doesn't doesn't want to go play. Well then okay, if we're talking weather then 
just and I get uh, it's a theoretical. Listen, this is not the first time we've done a DP World Tour schedule breakdown on this podcast. Um, if, if you're looking at the events in between now and the Ryder Cup, like could you see him playing? I can't imagine he'll play next week in Switzerland, but could you see him play the Irish Open or, or the BMW? You know, at, he, at he could be committed to one of those. I, I'm not sure, I, I haven't looked, yeah, but. You know, I, I did not see him committed to those. I, I guess I'm just more curious, you know, if you are, if you're getting into a rhythm, you've been working on something, it's clicking into place. I guess winning twice in two weeks is probably good enough to say, all right, now I'm good taking a break. But, you know, just curious about the psyche of a guy where it's like, oh, like I got it. Now I got to stop. Now it's the off season. Like, I don't want to stop now. No, I, I totally get that. But that happens every year for a, a champ, like a normal championship, right? You know, this, right, is, right, right. this was, I guess, their Super Bowl. You know, he just won $18 million. And, you know, the, the NFL, the NBA, they, they finish on a win, you know, he, he can surely finish on a win. And that's the way, you know, this, this is supposed to be, it's supposed to be the end of the season. You know, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he didn't play one event before the Ryder cup and just, just showed up there. I think there, that'll be the case for a a lot of the guys. I I don't see. I think there are a couple of big names in the the BMW. I think Rory's committed to that. Uh, Shane Lowry, I think a couple of others. Yeah. I don't know this. I mean, it's like, it's a crazy thought. It's spoken from the mind of like a amateur player who shoots a good round. It's like, yeah, we should go play an E9 and then it all falls apart. I'm like, why did I just, (laughs) why did I just stop and just uh, have a cold one in the, in the, the uh, club room with my guys. But, um, so I I, want this too. I wanted to add this you know, I, I mentioned the masters shooting 65 that first round, you know, he, he was battling head to head, like with Brooks cap at the PGA, yeah. like he, uh-huh. he could have easily won there where we talk about just looking at the majors as a recap at the end of the year. And, you know, was he, was he close to winning? Yes. I, I do think, you know, he kept putting himself in position, you know, never really got over the hump at the open championship or the U S open, but those other two events, he was right there. So it's, you know, he'll be knocking down the doorstep. Definitely these next four next year. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, we have further down the rundown, but it's worth just jumping into right now. I'm just curious to, to look at the player of the year debate, right? Because uh, they, they won't be voting on this until actually November um, after the RSM. But, you know, of course, that, that will have more impact on the rookie of the year race than it will for player of the year. And, and it looks like player of the year effectively is a three horse race right now between Scotty Scheffler and John Rom for most of the year. But I think it's fair to consider Victor as well. So you kind of talked there about his performance at the majors, you know, in terms of combined major scoring, he was second to only Scotty Scheffler. Scotty was 18 under for all four majors. Victor was 16 under Ram was 15 under in terms of strokes gained, same sort of picture. Scotty led with just shy of 45 strokes gained. Victor was just shy of 43 and Ram was just shy of 42. So pretty tightly bunched there. So just looking at like some of the other categories where we could maybe say, you know, how are we going to separate those guys? So if you look at all their nine wins, um, Scotty actually had the first and the third, uh, strongest, uh, the, the, in terms of field rating strength of field for OWGR points, Scotty's win at the players was, was the strongest field and yep. his win at the WM Phoenix open. W Phoenix Open was the third strongest field. Rom was second wow. at the Genesis. Uh, Victor's win at the Memorial was the fourth strongest field out of those nine wins for those guys. That's I actually think, really, that's really good. I mean, that's, it should be a good indicator for what this award is all about. You know, it's like who, who won their events because it is very close race between those three this year. I honestly would just lean on whose, whose wins were, were more difficult. You know, that's probably a a good way to, to judge this because, you know, I, I could make a case for all three. Well, and that's what I think. It, listen, and we'll get we'll get into Scotty's putting, and it and it it was a certifiable train wreck this week. He almost lost five and a half shots on the greens. I think he four jacked the the eighth green today. It's just it's just a tough mm. visual to leave with. But if you look at it, just his consistency over the course of the year, he has those two wins that were really really strong fields. Um, if you and this these stats were only through the BMW last week, but if you combine John Rahm and Victor Hovland's strokes gain T to green, they'd still fall 20 strokes combined less than more than 20 strokes combined less than what Scotty did over the course of the year. I mean, Scotty, it Scotty crazy. it's insane. Scotty had 175 strokes gain total with negative. 17 strokes gained putting through the BMW championship. And that that's going to move even more after this week. So for me, it's hard to look at those resumes and still not go with Scotty, but I don't know. Do you have a different take on what it means to be the player of the year? 
and how the players might vote on uh, it. Man, I just think you got to factor the majors into it. I know it's a, uh, it's just difficult right now between those guys. I, I'm leaning John Rom just with mm-hmm. winning at the Genesis. He, he was unstoppable at the beginning of the year. It just, you know, his his run from the century right at the top of the year all the way uh, through the Masters was was you know that was Player of the Year type stuff. And yep. then, but really, then we've never had the consistency from a player like we saw from Scotty Scheffler. You know, that was Tiger Woods ask what he was doing yeah. with the golf ball, tee to green, never finishing outside the top 12. You know, that's something that we're like, how is this guy? That is player of the year stuff. And then I would probably go in the same sense of, you know, Victor Hovland's probably very comparable to John Rom without the major championship. I would say they had very similar years where they got. Uh, I, I honestly think that Victor probably, in my opinion, had a better year, but the problem is he didn't win a major. You know, if he would have won the PGA, I would have said, yeah, give it to Victor Hovland because I think he was more consistent uh, throughout the year where I felt like John was just really good on the West Coast and then played, you know, very well at the Masters, played incredible and deserves player of the year if he gets it. But I'm probably, oh God, it's tough, man. I, it's I, so I would hard. probably... I probably lean wrong because I think you have to factor in the majors here major. and Scotty and Scotty and uh, Victor didn't win one. It's, it's a, it's a totally fair one. And I actually kind of see it the other way from you where Victor to me prior to the tour championship win was almost like Scotty light. It's like so consistent, didn't miss a cut all season, you know, one, two events, but just didn't have the major win, even though he played good and couldn't get done the big moments, I, it, which is why the tour championship win makes it a little bit interesting, even though it was a limited field. And you talking about Victor? Like you thought his year now. was like, not like, I, thought, oh, no, I thought he, I thought he was like Scotty light, you know, prior oh, yeah, to this yeah, win. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm just gotcha. like, didn't miss a cut like, all season you, long. We missed something there. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think, I mean, it's, you know, like, listen, if you're like putting me on, I, I have, a world of respect for John Rom, but if you're like Charlie, this is like debate class. You have to put an argument together that's against John Rom winning the Player of the Year. Um, the Genesis win, like he went out and beat Max Homa. Those guys went at it. It was like a really good finish. But like you could theoretically say, like the Century, like Colin Morikawa kind of gave it to him. A hundred percent. David Thompson that's what I was gave it to at. him. Like you, Masters Brooks kind of gave it to him. It's like he, he had he to go out and win those tournaments. But, wins. Oh, easily. Yeah. So I I think it's 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 interesting and I think there'll be a lot. I mean, but he got the job about, done. He's a he killer. That's why he, be said I think that. that's why he deserves it. Is he's a killer. He got the job done. And I look at Scotty and I look at Victor and Victor. Eventually, by the end of the year, he found what it takes to win. And I think just his overall, just the talent bucket. He had no weaknesses by the end of the year, but he had opportunities earlier in the year where his short game was like in a good enough place to win. But I think back to, I think it was Bay Hill and he shot 75 on the last round and finished his 10th. And it was a little bit of that throughout the year that he just wasn't able to kind of get it over the hump and, and have that 28 on the back nine Sunday, like we saw at the BMW championship. I know that's a kind of an extreme example, but that's the type of killer instinct I'm talking about that we saw with John Rahm who took advantage. We say, you know, Maybe he shouldn't have won those events. Well, he did because you know what he did. He 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 applied the pressure and and he and he found out found a way to win. I think that's such an important metric in player of the year. If 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 we want to give player of the year stats, we give to Scotty Scheffler every single day of the week. But player of the year, right. I think, should go to the person who who played with the most courage to find a way to win golf tournaments. And I think to me that was John Rahm this year. Now, let me just throw one more curveball at you on this debate, right? So I know we're just voting on the PGA Tour season, but the the players who are voting on it are going to, they're not voting until mid-November after the RSM Classic. They're going to watch the Ryder Cup. You can't erase their memories. You know, that that whether or not you want to, you know, say it actually counts or it doesn't count, you can't just, you know, say, oh, that didn't happen. That doesn't count. So if Victor goes there, if if Europe wins, if he goes 5-0 and or 4-1, and is there any way he backdoors into winning this award just on like oh, continued yeah. momentum and um, you know 100%. just you know it's hard it's hard to remove that from the memory if he goes and does that. I think it's it's what if you know I think 
players much more than the media. It's like, what have you done for me lately? And I think a lot of people by the end of the year may forget about how good John Rom played at the beginning of the year. Yeah, and totally. If John Rom goes and goes one and three at the Ryder Cup, and they're like, you know what, he did because in my head, in my mind, just of thinking about John Rom's finish to the year, he's been off for quite some time now. It seems like to me, I, I need to go back and double check that. Uh, but I know he didn't have a great week here at the Tour Championship. He just seemed to be just kind of off lately. So yeah, you're right. I think uh, easily if Victor Hovland goes five and zero, oh and and you know John Rom goes over, that's a potential kind of door factor, opener, right? right? Well, I think the same thing could happen to Scotty. Like you know, uh, just what you've seen recently. Even though he actually is his finishing position, if you're just looking at the stats, you're like, okay, like you know, that's that's good enough. I think it was T six this week, but it just the eye test on the putting is so bad right now, and I think that's like. You know, so he he was negative five point four seven seven strokes gain putting this week. You know, we talked about it. four jack the eighth today. Um, how, how many sessions are you going to play him at the Ryder Cup, Scotty? Like this, I yeah, mean, this is like this is a real concern, right? Like, do you play him all five sessions? I think Zach Johnson's a great mind and a great putter. They, I think. Steve Stricker is he assistant captain? I, th- I think he's assistant captain. Dude, I would it's just easy sticks- to assume. It's just like you know, Strick, uh, I, Zach Johnson, Freddie Davis Couples, Love. <laughs> Davis Love, like any year, in- interchangeable. It does kind of seem like it's the good old boys club of the captains. Uh, <laughs> they, starting to look uh, that way. That's one I really do wish the Presidents Cup and the Ryder Cup would have a little bit different crew right. every year because to me, there's been a lot of really great players that um, haven't had the opportunity to be captains because. It's just the same six guys that get rotated like, around. I think the only tough thing there is like, because I've tried to I've tried to do this exercise in the past. It's like, who is it? You know, it's, oh, like, it's like one of the guys who I always thought I looked up to, and he had a great career. And I thought David Tom should have been yeah, a captain fair. or assistant captain. He wasn't anything, so uh, he kind of got skipped over in that process. He was just a player that came to mind of that kind of generation. But yeah, man. Uh, you know, if, just, I, if I'm Captain Johnson, though, I'm I'm sticking Steve Stricker with Scotty Scheffler and uh, and maybe Sam Burns with Scotty just to keep the, you know, I I don't I don't mind Zach picking Scott, Sam Burns at all. He had a great week at the Tour Championship, and he you know he's Scotty's best friend, and we'll he'll and we're talking like Scotty's like lost in his game. He's just he's just kind of not quite there with the putter because I'm looking here at the Ryder Cup points. And he's got double the amount of points oh, yeah. as the second guy. So, so we're talking about the number one uh, ranked player in the world. Like he's got some issue, but he's going to be fine. It's just, he's well, just I, not I, putting I, it that great. I, that, but I, and I think that uh, I'm, I mean, I'm sitting here, like I'm arguing for Scotty Scheffler as player of the year. I think what he's done this year is unbelievable. I just wonder, and maybe it's a similar argument like we made last week with JT, where, you know, right now it's not the time for him to do, uh, a deep dive into his putting stroke and figure it out right now is like, Hey, we're just trying to make it work week to week. We're in the middle of the playoffs. We're trying to take home some money and, and finish in a good position. And I'm now taking Victor over Scotty, man. I just, I take, I think players value wins over, um, over a statistical year. Oh, I, I'm, I'm saying more of like a uh, preparing for the Ryder cup is maybe, oh, he gets, gotcha, you, got you know, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like in the same way that, like we said with JT, where JT gets to go, now and work on his swing a little bit and work through some of the stuff that he couldn't really coming down the stretch because he was trying to shoot a score and he was trying to make the FedEx cup because that was going to be a piece of evidence to put him on the, on the Ryder cup team. Whereas Scotty, I mean, he was tinkering with putters. He used one, you know, a spider putter the first two weeks of the playoffs and then goes back to the blade this last week and it's disastrous. And so it's like, it looks really, really bad right now. Like no one's disagreeing with that, but you know, maybe now he gets to go deconstruct that a little bit and kind of work oh, yeah, on that for the totally. Ryder cup. You know, I don't know. I, I just, it's, it's a, it's a tough scene right now. And, and maybe, maybe saying, Oh, we got to pull him from, you know, one session or two sessions, a little knee jerk for the guy that's been the best player in the world for like the last year, year and a half. But I think it's certainly something you got to like talk about if, if that's, like if he goes out in those first couple of sessions and he misses some shorties and costs you some points, like it's gonna be weird just like putting him on the bench, you know. I totally uh, agree. Yeah. I just, you know, what I think, and I think that's where the depth becomes really, really important. So I mean, you know, let's kind of let's get right into it. Like we we saw there are a lot of 
Ryder Cup hopefuls, you know, tour championship. You know, some, so let's kind of let's kind of like rapid fire on each of these guys. I just want to hear where you feel like they came out. So like let's start with like the likely in group. Call Morikawa finishes tied for sixth. He was, you know, his starting strokes was was one under. So he was effectively, you know, 10 under, you know, for the week. Um, obviously, really, really good those first two rounds. Uh, not so good the last two. Um, I mean, he's a lock, right? Like, well, like, what are your feelings mm-hmm. on Colin heading into the Ryder Cup? Yeah, I, I think Colin will be on the team. So the just to recap, the six guys, Scotty Sheffer, Wyndham Clark, Brian Harmon, Patrick Cantlay, Max Homo, Xander Shoffley. That's the top six. I think the next two guys that are locks, uh, we'll say a three with Colin. It will be Brooks, Jordan, and Colin. And then it's yes. those last three. I, I would even say, I mean, I, like... If we're if we're gonna start doing who we think are gonna get picked, like I would almost put JT in the lock group now. Uh, yeah, I, I I would I was trending to get there. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say he's a hundred percent. Like if you're doing a draft right now, he's the twelfth pick. Like if because right. of this the situation uh, with his year and just not having uh, his best year. But yeah, dude, he's he's gonna be on this team. If it was up to the players, this guy's he's he's already picked. I, I think so. It's, I guess if we're doing it that way, effectively what we're saying is the guys who didn't play this last week were Brooks and JT, that, but we think they're on the team. So then it, we start going through the roster of the guys who did play, and we're saying of that likely in group, we just talked Collins in, and Jordan, you know, okay, yeah, he finishes 27th, one over for the week, but Jordan's in, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I think I think what it's, I'm pretty, this is my opinion, but I, I think that that Cameron Young and Keegan Bradley are going to be the first two out. See, that is interesting because I assume what you're saying by that is that you think Sam Burns is in. And, and I think and so. I, I, I like, just have I, that feeling that yeah. he's going to be on the team. And Sam played great this week. So Sam is a guy. Sam was, he started even, shot 10 under for the week to finish T9. But I, I'm pretty sure we have it right here. I think he, I think he, if, if, if there were no starting strokes, he would have finished T4 this week with Colin Morikawa. Yep. So a heck of a week for him. I mean, I think that. This is what he had to do this week coming off, uh, you know, a performance of the BMW where he had that, he shot that 62, but his other three rounds were 71, 271s and a 70. So this is, I mean, you know, and I think, you know, kind of to your point earlier, like he's a guy you compare with Scotty. Maybe that helps a little bit psychologically being with a buddy of yours. Oh yeah, definitely. I think that's, uh, those two guys are really good friends. They've already, they played the president's cup a little bit together, um, as partners and, you know, I think definitely having a relationship and a guy who knows you really well to build you up and um, to let you know when you're a little off, you know, I think it's important. But um, I really think, you know, looking at this uh, leaderboard from this week, just the the non-adjusted leaderboard, Keegan Bradley could have really made things difficult for Zach Johnson today if he went so out just, there and shot. You just don't six. think enough, not enough from him? I really think if he would have been sitting there, like he finished... He shot 63, 67, 70, and they shot 73 today. Yeah. It's, it's if he would have gone there. out there and shot 66 today, it's seven shots less. He'd have finished at 14 under relation to par. That would have been third place overall. And you're just sitting there like, man, this guy yeah. on the U.S. team rankings, he's sitting there at 11. So he's technically qualified to be a top 12 player. Um, and that just to me would have been a, a – a real tough deal for Zach to try to figure out if Keegan would have found his way kind of in the leaderboard where that little box with five names at the top and he would have been there. I think it would have been really difficult for Zach to, because then that's where I think whether it be Sam Burns or JT, I think JT's still a lock, but I think JT definitely didn't need a week uh, from from Keegan Brad Bradley to finish in the top three, and then going back to last week, Cam Young playing his way into the, if he would have played his way in the Tour Championship and had a really good week, I think those two guys could have um, knocked knocked JT out. But it's yeah, I would I would think if you asked the team, they would want they would say JT is on the team. You ask the media who's or just the golf world who should be on the team as far as JT's concerned. And I would say 50% would say he should 100% be on the team. Yeah. And the other 50 are so adamant that he shouldn't. So it's the most debated player to make a team in a long time. But I think he, I think he's definitely a lock. Well, see, I mean, I, I you know, again, and, and who am I? But I mean, I, I'm just one person. Everyone's got an opinion on this. But I mean, I really don't even think the conversation is centered around JT anymore. I mean, I know that's a media thing that we're doing. But really and truly, if you're looking at 
I think especially if you're looking at the top half of your roster that have automatically qualified and you have guys that don't have experience, uh, you know, in, in Wyndham Clark and Brian Harmon, it doesn't mean they won't play well. They just don't have experience. So it's a, it's a little bit of a question mark. Um, and, and your best player on your team is kind of going through it right now, you know, on, on the, in terms of putting that even becomes more of an argument for take the guy with experience. Who's won in this format, who, you know, like if you take him and he doesn't play well, I'd rather get burned on that than trying for a cute pick and leaving him at home and getting burned, you know, on, on a guy that shows up, doesn't have experience and doesn't play well. So I like, to me, I really do think that that Brooks Jordan call and JT group is pretty much the lock. I'm not saying I agree with this. I, I have it as Cam Young, Keegan and Ricky in a three for two situation situation right now. I, I feel like it just seems to me like there's a real infatuation. Amongst- so you don't think Burns is on? I don't think Burns makes it even yeah. playing well this week. And I, I think that it just seems like there's a real infatuation with Cam Young's talent among that group. That's making the kind of devise on the picks and making the picks right or wrong. Um, I think Cam Young is going to get a pick. And then I think it comes down to whether you take Keegan off a hot week or you take Ricky for, you know, a little more body of work this season. I, I just, I, that is where I think it comes down to. And honestly, like, if Cam Young goes and he doesn't play well, like that to me is would be in line for more criticism than a JT pick. Like that's just my opinion. Like I could be wrong, but I really yeah, I think I think yeah, if you, this if you JT take him, is so debated, you know that. I, oh, totally. Yeah. I, I just think if you take a guy that you know he he has a ton of talent, but he hasn't putted it great. You don't really know. He's kind of keeps to himself, so you don't really know who you're going to pair him with. You know, part of the whole thing is pods and chemistry. Like that to me is more is of a it, question mark yeah. than a, than a JT is, you know, I, I can have that wrong. That's my opinion. I don't get positive vibes from Cam Young watching him play. To me, he's just not a high energy guy. And, you know, he's undoubtedly one of the so most talented, talented players so in the talented. world. But I just, I just think he's been super negative this year. To me, Paul Tesori is the most positive it's caddy in the world. And, and to, even still, uh, I just... Maybe it's just the way that he is. He just, that's just kind of his personality, but you know, it's just not like a slam dunk. Like who do you pair him with? Like who's going to be the person to, to really get Cam Young excited, you know? (laughs) So, uh, you know, I I mean, I, I, I a hundred percent agree with you on that. I I think almost, I mean, this is really me me playing armchair psychologist, but it almost felt like he was on the the tipping point of, Hey, I'm going to start really playing good. I've made this change to a caddy who's tour tested. He's a positive guy. He contrasts with me. Well, we play well in the match play. It's all going to take off. And then it doesn't, I think that almost fuels the frustration a little bit more. And so, I mean, again, he's insanely talented. I just, I have trouble seeing where he fits in that team. Unless my, my outside pick there is uh, you could do surly boys, uh, him and Brooks Kepka. just, you know, we got a real oh, tough Cam exterior. And Brooks. <laughs> Cam yeah, and Brooks yeah. and it either goes really, no really great or it this, goes really, nobody's getting a compliment you know, in this group. Comments. It's going to be really icy the entire time. We're going to hit the ball a mile and either we like boat race people or we get boat raced and you know, that's how it goes. But I don't know. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of how I see it. I think, I mean, if we're then talking about the guys we haven't mentioned, like, I don't think, I think Lucas just kind of fizzled. Lucas Glover just fizzled a little bit the last couple of weeks. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Russell Henley made a little bit of a play this last week, you know, but I, I just think like, he's had a great year. I really hope he makes yeah. a team um, pretty soon. And, you know, I, when it comes to Ricky, I think what, you know, when, when Zach Johnson is going to be looking at really all these players that we're talking about, it's, it's like, what do these players bring as far as how do they pair? Well, are they a good teammate? You just don't need to have something on, on your card that says that's a liability. And with Ricky, there's no, to me, there's no liability on his card. He's, he's been there. He's won uh, plenty of matches in international play. He's a great teammate. And, you know, he, he gets along with every single person in the room, brings a lot of experience and you just, you just don't have a doubt, like any doubts necessarily about him. I think what the only doubt you have about him is just like, you know what? I think some people are just not quite ready to say Ricky's back where I think a majority of the people are, but I think if you're uh, in that crowd where you're debating Cam Young, it's like, well, we saw Cam Young at the open championship last year, finished second and almost win. And that's what people debate. It's like, when was the last time that, you know, 
you know, Ricky did it at the you know, U.S. Open, but still, I think that's where people will start to play that comparison game with guys. But yeah. um, it's uh, it's I think it's it's become easier for me to figure out what he's going to do. Um, I think Sam Burns just checks off all those boxes too. There's nothing I really agree. that 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 to me doesn't you know he gets along with all the guys. They're all around his age, and with Keegan, I you know he's had a great year. Uh, there's there's nothing to not like about his year. And I think he gets along with all the guys and it wouldn't surprise me if he picked him, but I just think that Burns being best friends with Scotty chef or makes it, that means something. <laughs> it really does. A hundred percent. It does. I mean, I think that it's like, you got, you kind of got to create a vibes unit with these next six picks. You know, we're going to have to go in there and find a way to, um, you know, kind of up, up the vibes and 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 just come in with with some good feelings because it has been a little bit of a rocky end of the year for some of these guys and no one really went out and like took it. So I think there, there's a lot to be said for let's kind of add some experience, add some guys that are going to be assets in the team room. And, um, you know, and that gives us the best chance over there. So, uh, I mean, look, this is clearly a hot topic for debate. And this is, you know, you and I are both excited about this. Uh, we are going to be reacting to these to Zach Johnson's captain's picks live on, on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube right now and go at the smiley show, which is of course, S M Y L I E go to our page, subscribe. We are going to live stream uh, our reaction to the team USA captain's picks on, on Tuesday, August 29th. Um, we'll go live just a few minutes before 10 AM, which is when Zach Johnson will go live with his picks. Uh, and so, yeah, make sure to go subscribe. Now we are excited about our, our first, our first live stream, Smiley. Uh, the I first did put many. that in. I put it into the yeah. air last week, and you have figured it out. You have gone <laughs> to the Google machine, and and uh, we're, we got it rocking and rolling. I just got to keep putting ideas out on the live pod to make you uh, feel obligated to oblige. It, it's it's a very it's a good negotiating position you found. Where you're like, hey, if I just say it to our full audience, you can't not do it. It's like, yeah, that's that's good. That'll work. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're excited about that. Um, definitely come watch along with us. Comment along with us. We loved it for the audience to be a part of this, asking questions, participating. So, um, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Please don't yell at us if we have tech problems because you're just yelling at me. I'm doing my best. So, <laughs> um. Smiley, that's kind of all I had for the golf for this week. Uh, and of course, you know, we'll have this. This is obviously you're listening to this on a Monday and you're going to have that Ride Cup, Ryder Cup live show mm -hmm. in your feeds uh, on Tuesday. If you didn't watch the live show, um, college football season. I mean, it's it's actually already begun. There was like week zero games last week. I, I just it was shocking to me to see Notre Dame and USC playing this last week and before the end of the PGA tour season. But I guess that's where we are uh, with the college football. But I mean, I just feel like, is it worth kind of digging in a little bit to our respective alma maters and, and doing a little preview of, of a college football season? Cause I know you're fired up for your opener. I'm cautiously fired up for my opener. Um, I mean, what do you Absolutely. think? Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's, here's what I, here's how I think we should do this because uh, you know, the, the, the best way to kind of figure out how this is going to break out for your LSU Tigers, which by the way, currently fifth in the AP poll, I guess. And, and my North Carolina Tar Heels, which are, we are 21st in the AP poll. Um, it's just to go game by game and just win loss, total it out. And mm -hmm. we're going to see, we're going to, so let, let's, let's start with the, with the Bayou Bengals, uh, opening up Sunday, September 3rd on ABC at 7.30 p.m. Eastern against the Florida State Seminoles, eighth in the nation. What are, what are we thinking about this game? Well, our defensive lineman just got our best, Saw probably that. one of our best players just got suspended. Uh, he did an autograph signing a week before the NIL <laughs> became a thing two years ago. <laughs> and somehow the NCAA just said, oh yeah, let's suspend this guy uh, because he never never paid up on his suspension, even though he was hurt the entire year last year, which is basically like in a suspension. And it, I mean, it's just so dumb. Did you see Brian Kelly try to schedule a week zero game to get the suspension served and said that? Yeah. I love that. That's love amazing. That. It's about the, it's about the best thing going. Um, well, what do I think of this game last year? This game was such a mess. Both these teams didn't know what they had. They got better as the year went on. We end up winning the West and the sec. We could have easily lost, we could have easily gone six and six last year, but we could have easily almost gone undefeated. <laughs> it was like that type of year. And no, I don't think we could have beaten Georgia, but to one loss. So okay. other, 
you know, I, I coming into this year, we're going to, we're going to be pretty good. I think this game is probably going to be our most difficult game of the year. Honestly, I think it really wow. just matchup wise. They, I think they're probably going to have the best QB that we play the entire year. Jordan Travis and, is a problem. Yeah. And they have probably the best set of wide receivers that we're going to play this year. So that combination with a secondary that I'm, it's very new. Uh, we have a really good defensive line. So if, if our linebackers and defensive line play well to kind of hide our DBs and uh, I'll like our chances, but yeah, just, I Win mean, Florida, loss? Florida are, States uh, I, right now I'm, I've, God, I'm going to, I'm, I've been catching all this Florida State like just <laughs> buzz in my head that I think that they're going to win, but I'm going to say LSU is going to win, but it's going to be close. Okay, so we're like a penciled a penciled in W for LSU. Yeah, um, it, okay. If the, I think the line's two and a half right now, and okay. wouldn't surprise me if we won that we won by like a point and didn't even cover. So all right, Tiger's, so what, Tiger's money line, Tiger's money line, one and zero. All right, then next week home game against Grambling. Do, you, do we need to talk about this or should we show Are we going through at the like LSU's whole schedule? Oh, we're going game by game to get your win loss record, dude. Uh, no, I'll just passage. I'll just I'll skip you through all that. I think we'll uh I think mm, I think we'll win probably nine games. I think, yeah. I'm gonna give me give me nine and three. I think so we could go where to are 11. Your losses. Bam on the road. Could, Bam on the road. When, it's just when you play teams. I, yeah, you know, I I'll really know once we play four to say what we got, but I'm gonna go with nine now. But I think we could uh, be a one two loss team. Okay, but All right. I'm not sure where the losses will be. It, we could easily lose on the road at Mississippi State or Ole Miss. We could definitely lose on the road at Alabama, but. You know, I think all of the games when I look at them are all winnable games this year. It's just it just depends on uh, just how healthy we stay in certain parts, you know, of the uh, the depth chart. So we'll see. OK. All right. Well, and then, I mean, you know, you win enough games, you get a, a ticket to play the Georgia Bulldogs in the SEC championship game. <laughs> so that's always yeah, fun. Congrats. <laughs> we got a good quarterback, though. Right, well, I Jay say good Daniels, quarterback. Yeah, he's good. He's electric. No, like he's. He's a problem in an open space. Like you, you can't catch him. Yeah, but, it's so interesting. They hated him at Arizona State, but then, and I thought he was going to be a dud. And then he played, you know, seemingly pretty great, good last year. He's really, really fast, and he just sometimes gets a little gun shy to throw the ball, and he just holds it too long. So mm. we'll see if he improves on that and and is a little better about taking shots down the field. And that, I think that uh, will open up our offense a little bit. So we'll see. What about well, UNC? We, what do you we have the greatest quarterback of all time. I don't know if you've heard Drake May. Uh, basically, I heard the same thing the about Mitch position. Trubisky too. Uh, that was see, listen, you're, this that's old news. Like we are, we are quarterback. You, of course, uh, you know, home of uh, Mitch Trubisky. Uh, you know, Bryn Renner, uh, husband of Amanda Renner. For all you golf fans out there, um, you know, really? Sam Howell, current starting quarterback of the Washington Commanders, and now, of course, um, yeah, Drake May. So, listen, I was nervous about this season. I I thought it was going to be a tough schedule. I was thinking like, like as of like two months ago, I was thinking like seven wins max, but then like hope springs eternal it happens every time right around this time of year, like end of July, early August. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, we're all the way back. Like we are going <sighs> to steamroll everybody. So, so this is where you're on the cycle right now. I'm, uh, before I'm, this, before, all right, because I'm on the other end of the cycle. I'm like, oh gosh, we're, <laughs> dude, you got, you got, you got to have the confidence cresting before the first game of the season. And by the way, there is nothing like, if you're a North Carolina Tar Heels football fan, the the five of you out there that are listening, there's nothing like a season opener in Charlotte. You get a road trip with the boys. Mm. Bojangles, you know, boxes the morning of you're pre gaming, you're having some biscuits and, and, you know, chicken Supremes dipping them a honey mustard. There's just nothing like it. And so we, the beginning of Sam Howe's tenure was a win against South Carolina and Charlotte. And I think I, I, I want to replay that this year. It's a, it's going to be a tight game. They have Spencer Rattler quarterback. It's a good team. I think the line's like maybe less than two now. I think last time I checked was like one and a half or two. But I think it's going to be a momentum starter win. So one and oh. All right. Then we're home home against See, App State. I'm, I'm taking South Carolina against you. You're taking South Carolina against us? All right. Now, here's, here's the thing. is If we lose South Carolina, it could be a real problem. 
there's going to be, it's going to well, be, be a real problem for you. Cause you're going to totally, you're going to be off the, off the reservation. Yeah. I'm going to come here seeking therapy from you every single week of the season as I spiral further and further down into despair, because I, I care about Carolina football probably more than any other team on earth for some bizarre reason. And this happens to me every year like this, but, but right now I, I have a lot of hope. So I'm thinking win against South Carolina, then home against app state. That was a close game last year. Um, and we had maybe the worst defense in the history of the game of football, but this year, I think we're going to, we're going to, you know, write that ship a little bit. So when there, then home against Minnesota, can you just give me what y'all are going to go? That's going to be a win. Well, I'm, I'm working through it right now. We're three, and know, <laughs> road against Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is always tough on the road. I just, um, I mean, I, I just don't know if I can go through an entire ACC schedule. And... That's a win, four zero. All right, <laughs> then we're home against Syracuse. Win five and zero. Miami home. We always, as no matter how good or bad we are, the last couple of years, we always boat race Miami, and it's the thing that makes me happiest about college football. So that's a win, six and zero. Virginia at home, South's oldest rivalry. We're going to be up for that. That's a win, seven and zero. Then we're on the road in Atlanta, Georgia Tech. Um, that is a win. Now we're eight and zero. I think. Yep, we're eight and zero. Uh, Campbell at home win nine and zero. Duke on the road win ten and zero. Then we're on the or no Duke at home. So that's definitely a win ten and zero. And then we're on the road against Clemson. Um, listen, I sat in Charlotte <laughs> once again last year, uh, and they played DJ Ugalele for two drives, and I was convinced we were going to win the ACC championship game, and they put in Kate Klubnik. And that was the end of that. So I'm going to say loss there. So now we're 10 and one and then road against NC State last game of the season. That's a revenge <laughs> game. We got hosed last year. We're winning that game. So we're 11 and one. We're going to the ACC title game against Clemson. And it's hard to beat a team twice in one season, as we know. Oh, we so <laughs> then we're beating Clemson in that game. 12 and one. We're in the college football playoff. How about that? <laughs> Gosh. How about that? That's what you have to look forward to this fall, Smiley. A lot wow. of North Carolina Tar Heels football optimism. I didn't it's know they made any light blue Kool-Aid, but I, oh. apparently you're drinking it right now. <laughs> drinking a lot of it. I mean, oof. I mean, yes. the ACC is going to be garb this year, so it wouldn't surprise we're me. Off. We're just, I don't know, we're garb. We're just, we're very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of parody in the ACC, I think is how we <laughs> market that. <laughs> And it's it works works as far as I'm concerned. Um, Good for you for being that high on your team. I mean, I just it's it's one game mentality uh, for us LSU Tigers, okay, so I, we can't look ahead. So good for you for looking ahead, but <laughs> us LSU Tigers, it's just one game at a time. Like the one thing they tell you not to do: don't get too far ahead of yourself. Well, I'm already twelve and one in the CFP, so <laughs> thank you very much. I'll see you there. Book my tickets. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, there's going to be some golf this fall, and it's going to be interesting golf. And of course, this is a golf podcast; so we will talk about that, but. It's college football season, you know, so we're going to have to mix a little bit of that in. So this is a little table setter. I need all my heels, heels fans out there riding with me. Uh, it's going to be a good season. Drake May is going to win the Heisman. So uh, I just don't know if I can take a whole fall season. of us breaking down the ACC. It's just like, I don't know if I can listen to it. <laughs> it, it <laughs> I mean, it's, it's gonna, I mean, listen, Either, it just doesn't mean more in the ACC. It, it, I, I, think, I think it's supposed to mean more in the ACC, but uh, I mean, we're not even going to have a conference in like two years. So just let me have I'd this. I'd actually love, like, I would love for UNC to come to the SEC. That'd be awesome. I would love for that too. I would be amazing. I, w- I would go, we'd get absolutely boat race, but I'd just be sitting out there in the no. blue zone wearing shorts. Hey, y'all, y'all would hang in there. I mean, 40 the, points. It's just... It, the SEC, we need boosters. Like, we need better boosters. Like we see it in bowl games where you know these teams all our SEC years have a you know bad bowl record, but it it's more of just like the the overall depth of the conference week in week out. It's like when you play uh, on the road out of Kentucky, it's just not the. It's just it's a very difficult game. You know, it's it's so hard to explain why it's hard to play at Mississippi State in week six, but it just is. <laughs> I listen, I hear you. I mean, I'll tell you this. I guarantee you we can do Vanderbilt's job better than Vanderbilt. Oh my God. Can we just, 100% can agree. we get Vanderbilt out of there? I, we can, <laughs> we can do Missouri's job better than Missouri. Like just, there are, there are a lot of teams in there that I'm 100%. looking at. And I'm like, we can do your job better than you can do your job. You're know. on notice. Missouri's we'll come to SEC. Give Missouri credit. 
Do I have to give Missouri credit? Do I really? Is that something I have to do? You don't have to, but they've done better than they thought they would. They've they've made it to an SEC title game. And honestly, last year against Georgia, they played them better than anybody. Uh, Maybe because Georgia had such low expectations for Missouri. I, I mean, it's just for whatever reason, Missouri's they've hung in there. They played good games. So, <laughs> so which, that's so that's something you can say about I, Missouri. <laughs> I will let you shame uh, the Florida Gators. I will let you shame okay. them, but you do not shame the Missouri, Missouri Tigers. I, this, this is a total <laughs> shocker. I did not expect to come out of this podcast with Smiley as a Missouri Tiger stand. Um, but here we are. I mean, I, I think any of those other teams, I, I'll tell you really what I want to do. I want to go on a road trip. Like I want to go to Baton Rouge and walk around to from trailer to trailer and have people go tiger bait tiger bait like i want to do that and be the yeah. the 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 road fan experiencing that cuz we just don't really have that mm. in the acc like that really i mean i guess you know certain schools really care i mean clemson of course florida state but like i we don't have enough of that culture at carolina on the football side of things so if you're forced to do it as part of a of a conference like the SEC, I think it just starts to naturally happen. Yeah. That's my North, that's my thought. I would love to have North Carolina and Clemson. That would be two great football, basketball, really all sports. Uh, would be how about Florida State at. too? Florida uh, State, Clemson, Carolina. You don't want Florida State in there because I mean that's, I don't know. I'm just mad at the them for State beating Florida us Florida. last year, and then I'm yeah. worried they're going to beat us again. It's like why do I want to <laughs> add a team to beat us two years in a row? So right now I'm I'm talking about the ACC being garb, but we lost to them see? last year, so we'll see. I don't know. What I don't want is for Miami to come. Miami, you cannot come. So no, sorry, I don't think that's You're a fit. Out. It's not really a good fit either. No, definitely not a good fit. Yeah, they can just they can get lost. So. Well, there you go. That was a pretty good little uh, little college football teaser right there. Like, I'm fired up now. I needed this to kind of get me going. I'm over the hump. I'm ready to go. We're 12 and one. Um, this is this is going to be good. So we'll check in with you. We actually we will not check in with you in a week because we were taking that week off for uh, you know end of the season kind of housekeeping. But a couple of weeks we'll check back in with you to get a temp check on where we stand after a couple college football games. But um, that is all for this week. Um, as mentioned before, uh, go subscribe to our YouTube page because tomorrow we will be live streaming those Ryder cup captains picks. And that podcast will also be in the speed after that episode airs live. Um, and then we'll be back here with another, another interview on Thursday. So, uh, smiley, any, any final thoughts to send the, the good audience on their way? Yeah. Uh, to all the listeners, uh, thank you. It's been a fun 2023 PJ tour season. We yeah. joined you guys in March and, we didn't really know what this podcast was going to look like, but uh, we have found that it's been very fun to, you know, kind of give our take on the game. And I think uh, we've had a lot of people on uh, social media that have kind of followed us, our journey along the way. So I think this one, uh, you know, shout out to uh, all of y'all that are listening because it's been uh, Charlie and I really enjoyed this year to this point. We're excited about what's to come as well. Our first live show. So how about that? Yeah, that was sincere and heartfelt and I feel the same way. And uh, yeah, lots of exciting things on the horizon. We appreciate you all coming along for the journey. So, I mean, you see that, you see what I just said there? I can talk shit about your football team, but also yeah. then compliment our, our loyal listeners and see, that's just, that's just the kind of guy I am. That's the duality of Smiley <laughs> Kaufman. He's a man of many layers, including Missouri Tigers football fandom. Somehow. No, so, uh, I'm wearing purple. <laughs> you're watching on YouTube, which you should be. He's wearing his LSU purple. So, Uh, That's all for this week. Thanks so much for listening and we will see you back here tomorrow.